Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to The Prep Life. Let's get into it with the news. This balloon thing is starting to evolve into something that's bad. Apparently, according to the Pentagon, the balloon program spread over five continents, meaning it was probably or likely simultaneously launched onto sensitive sites. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken revealed Wednesday that the U.S. assesses the alleged Chinese spy balloon shot down over the weekend was part of an expansive surveillance program aimed at gathering intelligence from targets around the globe. Speaking at a joint conference with NATO's top official, Blinken said the administration was already sharing what the U.S. intelligence community uncovered with America's allies in Congress. Senior admin officials on the Hill uh, said that we already share the information with dozens of countries around the world, both from Washington and from our embassies. We're doing this because the United States was not only the target of this broader program, which has violated the sovereignty of countries across five continents. Meanwhile, at the Pentagon press briefing, Brigadier General Pat Ryder disclosed that China has conducted four balloon surveillance missions over sensitive sites within the U.S. territory during recent years, but not disclose exactly when or where the incidents took place. They were over sites that would be of interest to Chinese, but I'm not going to go into specifics. What? Okay, that's... That's a huge probe into our national security. Let, let me give you a little bit of the, the open source version of this, of how this works. Um, and some of this is assumption-based because I don't know the exact uh, line-out of how this would work, especially when it comes to a balloon. But this is what I think. A balloon at a certain elevation cannot be detected via radar, nor do we have the capability, I guess, in space um, – to be able to identify this as a moving object because satellites in the same orbit around the Earth are moving at the same elevation. So if we're tracking satellites, it would be a blip on the potential radar. And this would allow for basically a satellite to float on a balloon, slowing its, its basically its orbit down. Because if you've ever seen a satellite as it screams across the sky... It hauls ass across the sky. But if you have a balloon, it's moving slower. Now, why would it need to move slower? Well, to collect imagery. But I think more important than the imagery is the signal intelligence that it could suck up as data and then redistribute through satellite networks, um, basically being used as relays, or directly to the source where it would collect that information and beam it down to China. So let me give you an example. It could intercept signal communication or cell phone communication through a, an elaborate network of satellites, suck up that information, relay it by hopping different satellites, and then dropping it down into the intelligence collection of the Chinese government. Um, why does that mean something here? Because that is a direct violation of our sovereignty. As discussed, it says, however, U.S. Uh, senior officials told ABC chief global affairs correspondent that previous incursions into American airspace took place over Hawaii and off the coast of the continental United States, specifically near Coronado and Norfolk, Virginia. That's scary because I think e even in the open source, besides having SIL teams there, you also have profound capability with submarines and battleship uh, carrier groups. Um, Two of the nation's largest naval bases are located. The official said that the U.S. had briefed India, Japan, Vietnam, and Taiwan, all of which appear to have been surveilled by the Chinese balloon. Now, the controversy for most Americans is why did we wait from northwest, entering Pacific Northwest, until it came off the coast of South Carolina to shoot this balloon down? And the answer could be we didn't want to compromise the intelligence gathering um, that we were doing while it was traveling across the United States. I mean, open source, the White House press conference um, has has put out that we were intentionally not shooting it down, not only to not harm people, but also to collect as much information as possible while the signal or the capability was being jammed up. I think that has to do with signal, but it was being jammed up. Now, that's that's crazy, guys, because... If five continents were intercepted here, um, five continents intercepted. I mean, there's not a lot of stuff on Antarctica, but let's say five continents were um, were surveilled 
What's the main purpose? And what's the threat to national security? Well, we are on the cusp of World War III with Russia. And do you know who Russia uses to intel, collect, gather information, and share? China. So the coalition of the Chinese and the Russian governments working and collaborating together, absolutely sharing intelligence information, are only giving the Russians all the information they need to potentially launch an attack on U.S. capability. Let me give you the doomsday scenario. All nuclear weapons are initiated. Um, uh, Intercontinental ballistic missiles, our air defense system shuts down as many as we can, and then China gets involved, and we can't shut them all down. Right? We could shut down one superpower with their four to 6,000 intercontinental ballistic missile capability, but can we shoot down North Korea, China, and Russia? Unlikely. So some of these missiles will get through to targeted attacks, including civilian populations. The EMP, the dirty bomb, the, you know, the fallout from nuclear warheads could mean the end of a lot of densely populated areas in America because our defense mechanisms only could do so much, especially as compromised. So you figure out all the capability of the enemy, then you work together to fight through that first barrier of capability and then intercept through, it's like the Sabo round of tactics, right? The Sabo round hits the, the vehicle, it penetrates to first um, breach, like the skin of the outside of the uh, craft, and then the, the Sabo penetrates with the munition into the cab and kills everybody in, in, inside. That's what this is. It's like the Trojan horse. It, it, this is scary. This is not normal. The Pentagon is also admitting this has been done before. We don't know how long or how many. Uh, I hope the intelligence community uh, does understand that. But the benefit here is we have identified a major flaw in our national security. Now, what I don't like is the at the Pentagon press conference when asked, is this a error? Did the intelligence community screw up? And the answer was no. And I would say that is a lie. I, I, like the last time I tracked the intelligence community when I got my degree on Homeland Security, there were 17 organizations, the NSA, CIA, NRO, the list goes on that existed in the IC, all headed by the Director of National Intelligence, the DNI, all falling under now uh, the Department of Homeland Security or in conjunction and cooperation with the Homeland Security. And we are looking at a fatal error um, in our national security with not a full understanding of the scope of how much we are exploited or compromised. That's scary. Like we fire military officers and non-commissioned officers for leaking Uh, unintentionally classified information. But politicians are leaking intentionally classified information, deleting classified emails, and misusing, including leaving out classified documents at private residences, and that's okay. How about we button up the hatches here, guys? How about we start getting serious about national security? Uh, Blows my mind. Blows my mind. It's also about perception. How does the world world perceive us as a nation? If you listen to the State of the Union uh, address last night, you would think, well, we aren't being looked at very strong in the international eye. From the outside looking in, we look very weak. I mean, imagine if Trump was the guy in charge, or even Obama, and that balloon started to maneuver across the United States. They would have cleared an entire state launched everything at that balloon, destroyed it, exploited exploited all of the things on it, and told China to go pound sand and put more sanctions and restrictions on them, which would hurt us as a nation because we are very dependent on Chinese everything. That is scary. That is scary that as the world perceives us, we are seen as weak and every major power, even the weak ones, are exploiting this weakness and deficiency to get ahead. And that scares the crap out of me. In other news, let's talk about this train derailment. Um, 
This is pretty scary, and I want to look up the latest and greatest. Right now, the train derailment in, um, in East Palestine, Ohio, it says the evacuation order lifted as officials say air and water samples show it's safe. But man, was this crazy for a period of time. Some of the imagery that I saw from people on the ground were these toxic clouds where they intentionally released um, the hazardous material in these trains on purpose to leak it out so it didn't explode and affect the population on the ground. In a press conference, authorities said the evacuation order has been lifted. The massive Fury train development happened on the, on the evening of Friday, February 3rd. On Monday, February 6th, officials released toxic chemicals from the tankers involved in the derailment. derailment. Air quality samples in the area of the wreckage and in nearby residential neighborhoods have consistently showed readings at points below safety screening efforts. Look, this is a good test of our hazmat capability and response. But here's what I want you to understand with all these things happening with Russia, the intercontinental ballistic missile um, threat to our nation, China spying on us with balloons. Like, guys, our national security and foreign policy have, has never been so weak and fragile as a nation in the history of our country. I mean, there's many cases and points to point to this, including the pullout in Afghanistan. I listened to the Joe Rogan podcast recently with a guy I respect. I don't remember the, the, uh, the guy's name, but he does a series of current event shows on YouTube and has a podcast on Spotify. And he was saying that, you know, President Biden made a hard decision to pull out of the country of Afghanistan. And, and he, he did the right thing. I don't think he did the right thing. One of the things that me and Chad Robichaud talked about on the Black Rifle Coffee podcast was, if you don't know who Chad Robichaud is, he's the author of Saving Aziz. Chad and a band of merry men walked into Afghanistan using their connections and assets to evacuate 17,000 Afghans that have worked with American forces, American citizens, and their families. 17,000. When we went into Afghanistan and we pulled out of Afghanistan, we didn't have a plan to leave anybody behind. I mean, like unintentionally, because of our bad policy and bad tactics on the ground, when we handed over the evacuation to the State Department, doing a non-combatant evacuation, which never happens in the history of evacuations, we screwed up. So if you note... Um, experiences through war, what we've done in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, we are still all over the United, uh, United States is still all over the world. We have troops in Korea. We have troops in Europe. We have troops all over where we were, where we fought uh, the four-year uh, war from 41 to 45 uh, in World War II, 50 to 53 in Korea. Um, depending on who you talk to in history, let's call it uh, 68 to 75 in Vietnam. We have signatures everywhere. And why? Because when you have access and placement to an area, especially in an area of crisis like the Middle East, then you have the ability to stage, launch, and stop fringe elements like the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and ISIS from becoming rogue franchises that spread throughout the world so not only are we not safer because of the pullout in afghanistan but we're more in danger than we've ever been because of the bad policy look the state of the union address was despicable yes sure there were moments where it was like yeah don't shout at the president while he's giving the state of the union address and call him a liar but when you make things up and give people a false sense of security you're not speaking the truth to, Amer to the American people. When you're calling an all-out assault ban, because that's the priority, when we have so much more going on in the world. I mean, I love the spiel about the uh, veteran affairs, where Biden was talking about how veteran affairs and suicide rates went from 27 down to 17, like that's a win. Or down to 15 is what he said, which I think is a flawed statistic. That's not a win. He talked about homelessness. And veterans being homeless. And no veterans should be homeless. Well, if you took the $100 billion that you spent in Ukraine and you divert that, that to veteran affairs or the homeless or both, then we fix a lot of America's problems. But we're not doing that because we decide 
when we have a president that's in bed with China and Ukraine, I mean, there are, there are direct connections linked through Biden's son with China and Ukraine and the history of um, Mr. Biden over time in cahoots with the Chinese demonstrating why we would would not want to shoot down a balloon over the Pacific Northwest and use, oh, we don't want to harm anybody on the ground as an excuse. He actually said, like, got caught on the way to the uh, to Air Force uh, One. They asked him, hey, why didn't we shoot it down? He said, well, they told me that not, not to shoot it down. You're the president of the United States. Stop. Just stop. All right, guys, moving on into... Um, Let's do mindset and resilience because I, I kind of skipped around last time we were talking about that. I got I got to talk to a guy named Devin who came in here who's a tactical cowboy. I did a podcast with him. Really um, intelligent young man. Really good values. Um, his fiance is a um, about to graduate physical therapist school, and he lives in in Spanish Fork, Utah. Uh, th- all this is going to be dropped on the Black Rifle Coffee podcast on Monday. But I bring him up because we talked about fitness. We talked about um, mindset, jujitsu. Look, I have felt guilty for years as a company not bringing you what I think is the number one priority in being best prepared and developing your mindset and developing your physical fitness. Jujitsu is the start point. Like, if you ask me, what is a way that I could become more resilient in all these things you talk about? Don't do gunfighter pistol with me. Don't do first aid with me. Don't work on technical skill sets. Work in the dojo and jujitsu. And then when you evolve that, you're not only becoming more technically proficient and grappling and choking people out, but you're learning a lot about life and building that resilience. Look, I talked to Greg Anderson, Chad Robichaud, Andy Stumpf, all these guys. I'm talking to Jim Miller soon. All these guys and gals, Leah Stump's involved as well, that have profound experiences in changing people's lives through jujitsu. Now, a lot of people have said, whoa, you're going to stir the pot starting an American jujitsu program. But guys, this isn't American jujitsu because Brazilian jujitsu is not good enough. This is Americans need a program focused on American issues according to self-defense, building resilience, etc. The base and foundation. Like the fundamentals of marksmanship are the foundation for gunfighting and self-defense. Brazilian jiu-jitsu is that. Brazilian jiu-jitsu started from a Japanese art form. I mean, the, the literal heritage, the, the literal origin story comes from a Japanese and Brazilian mix of martial arts coming together to build a hybrid based in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, based off of Japanese art forms. And when you take that and you take that as the foundation, then what do we implement? Well, we implement self-defense. We implement um, stand-up, a little bit of MMA. I'm not trying to invent the will here. I'm not trying to reinvent the will here. I'm just trying to build a based program that is going to be successful in building resilience in you. So I want the experts. Look, I actually want Hoist Gracie on the team. I want him as a member of our board so we do this the right way. I'm not trying to like I'm not trying to start a franchise here. I want to start the the best program based on a world of experience that I don't have. And my look, I'm a I'm a lines instructor. I'm a combatives instructor. I'm a, I'm a pretty skilled uh, uh, MMA um, competent person. I, I know stand up. I took Muay Thai. I took boxing. I took uh, ninjutsu. I took Taekwondo. Um, I'm certainly am a Jiu Jitsu practitioner who's getting back into it after having a broken back. But I want to do it the right way. And so that long, uh, drawn-out explanation is about bringing fitness to you as a start point in building mindset and resilience. In Salt Lake City, I'm looking in Draper, uh, basically southern Salt Lake, to build a 14 to uh, – the, the building I'm looking at now is like 14,000 square foot. 14 to 25,000 square foot space. Somebody made the analogy that was like y, the YMCA for Warriors. Yeah, but YMCA isn't cool. But it's, it's good because it brings community together. So imagine a place where on the back end, th- th- don't imagine, this is happening by the way, on the back end of this, you're going to have jujitsu, right? And you're going to have membership enrollment to do jujitsu three times a day. Moving forward a little bit, you have 
um, potentially uh, the tactical cowboy and his wife running the fitness program uh, that runs wads workouts of the day and physical therapy for the health and wellness component we have cold plunge hot sauna all of the things in health and wellness yoga uh Didi, who's my business development uh that works for my company used to run a yoga studio we will have yoga at phil craft survival push forward a little bit more simunitions and first aid and all the things in self-defense during the weekend flying kirsten out to teach personal security Flying Kevin Owens out to teach in Spanish Fork long gun. Uh, doing the tactical at Spanish Fork at a range down the road, but also hosting in-house training. A little bit more forward, we have the retail space. We have companies like Colorado Craft. We have companies like uh, Montana Knife. We have companies like Cleared Hot, the podcast. Black Rifle Coffee Company. We sell guns. We sell equipment. We sell all the things to bring preparedness to you in a one-stop shop. That's the vision that's becoming a new reality in the next 90 days because I'm pulling the plug on Heber because the cost in lease space is too high. Uh, it's becoming another park city. I don't like that because my employees can't afford to live up here. So I'm actually downgrading my circumstance in the fancy house that I live in from this studio, uh, which is too much for me, downsizing and getting into Salt Lake City. It's not a boo-hoo story. I, I just need to be where the work is and where my employees are. 95% of my employees work down in Salt Lake and they have a better quality of life. So that's where I'm going to move and we're going to hit a home run and we're going to do it together. Uh, I hope you move to Salt Lake because you believe in the mission and you want to be part of it. On EDC, let's talk about lights. I got two lights here. This is a uh, cloud defensive. Uh, I did a Patreon video. If you haven't subscribed to my Patreon, make sure you do so. Um, I did a, a video on lights, but there are a couple thoughts for lights. Handheld, uh, head, let's take headlamp, handheld, and gun mounted. Somebody asked me, like, hey, what's your light setup? All of those. I'm teaching a mobility course uh, in a couple weeks in our own backyard in Spanish Fork, and the entire ground is covered in snow because I want to show people with Mike Hernandez, my mobility expert, that this can be accomplished overlanding and off-roading and moving bu through bugging out can be accomplished by understanding how it works. Like if you compact snow and you're on ice, you won't have traction. But if you roll over snow solo and don't repeat your tracks or don't go over the same tracks, you'll actually increase traction from compacted snow. And there are a whole bunch of considerations in survival and the list goes on for this thing. So we're going to teach survival first aid. That course is sold out. I'm super stoked about it because John Courtney's coming up to, to cook. I got Clay Croft from Expedition Overland. I got Kurt Williams from the Land Cruiser Heritage Museum. Um, I got uh, Bowen Customs, the Bowen Brothers coming in. It's going to be epic. I can't wait for that. Um, but if you have a headlamp around your head, you could use both hands. If you have one hand on a light, you could have one hand on a gun. If you have a light just on your gun, then you have both hands on the gun. But if you need to use a light for utility, it's not smart to kind of scan under the hood or where you need to scan with a gun in line unless it's a self-defense scenario. Most scenarios with lights aren't self-defense related. It's re utility related. So you need to be set up for both. Um, look, the reason I decided to work with Cloud Defensive and potentially looking at building out a light a Philcraft edition of this is the same reasons I worked with Montana Knife on building a Philcraft edition knife, which we're, we're working on. We're, we're working on making, with Kevin Estella, the, my survival expert, the best survival knife ever made and made in America. Cloud Defensive is made in America. Nothing against Surefire because I love them. I mean, I've used Surefire in my military uh, contracting experience and as a civilian. I've taught low light, no light with those lights. But if I want to partner with a company and make lights, like I'm doing with Origin, with Jeans, like I'm doing with a, a lot of different companies, I want to put our country first. And Cloud Defensive is going to be that company. So we have different, two different versions of this that I'm testing right now because I will not do a collaboration until I fully have understood the deficiencies and benefits of both lights. Um, both of these lights are handheld. Um, you could program them to work with different lumens. And here's what I'll say. More lumens, it does not mean better. 
more lumens does not mean better necessarily. Um, on the mobility front, um, man, in, in mobility defense, I learned a lot this weekend. I did a vehicle defense level two in San Bernardino. Big shout out to my customers and clients who came out there. And for the first time, I wanted to identify what the hold over was on a target about five yards off the front of the bumper, a steel target with full metal jacket, what I would say is synthetic bonded ammunition versus hollow point. When you take those three different types of rounds, what is the change um, and how much you have to hold over for the specific, specific round? So here's what I'll say. Very surprised. Full metal jacket, single shot, nine mil from inside the cab to point of impact, three feet high. Three feet high. Synthetic bonded ammunition stayed together, hit the steel target, point of aim, point of impact on steel, a little high, but not off the target three feet, but still didn't um, maintain the integrity of that round. It, it came apart. And then hollow point, forget about it. It hit it as a fragment. Now, you take that in reverse where you're hitting glass out of the barrel at muzzle velocity maximized is different than taking the the gun and shooting it from the outside in. So let's go let's go back from outside in. Five yards off the front of the glass, same exact scenario, same position of where that target was at, shooting in, Hol or a uh, full metal jacket, point of aim, point of impact, pretty much. So two rounds, right where they needed to be. I mean, they, they deviated a little bit because you're going to get angled deviation on that glass. So facing the window straight on, you're going to get slight angled deviation. Um, synthetic bonded ammunition, both of them fragmented, were off the X, off the point of aim. One round went through, so it stayed together. The second round fragmented and broke apart. That's synthetic bonded. And I'll give you on my Patreon I'll break down the actual ammo that I used. I just don't have it in front of me right now. I do have, actually, the, the hollow point that we used. Now, look, I say hollow point because it's serrated. Um, it's Winchester Law Enforcement Ammunition called Ranger. It's 147 grain 9 mil called the T-Series. That, if you look at it, doesn't have, it has like an alloy in the bottom of it. But hit the windshield, completely fragmented, went through the car cardboard and buried itself in the top of the fabric of the seat. So almost no penetration. I mean, I, I literally picked it out with my hand and it was fragmented in pieces. And I put it on the hood of the car and was like, would that kill you? Here's what's interesting. The 13 rounds that my buddy Marlon shot in Las Vegas when facing a suspect was using the same kind of ammunition. Now, this guy, this ammunition that I was using was from another guy's department. But again, this is why the situation of your pattern of life and your environment needs to dictate the type of ammunition you use. Now, would these, would, would these three types of ammunition be different on a person? Yes, completely. But in the class, which was vehicle dynamics, we're testing shooting through windshields, shooting into windshields for self-defense situations with a pistol. So I was very surprised to see point of aim, point of impact with full metal jacket. Well, I wasn't surprised by that. I was a little bit surprised that the bonded ammunition, which is Winchester, I believe not Winchester, but um, Federal, very good ammunition, synthetic bonded ammunition. It's what I use for, for home defense. Um, it's also what I use uh, in my everyday carry pistol because it has the ability to impact, vertically displace, but it stays together and doesn't fragment. This Winchester Ranger, yeah, sure, on a person, probably does really good. But it hit that glass, turned into shrapnel, and hit the cardboard sideways with no penetration. Like, no penetration. That's the same thing that happened when my buddy Marlin shot 13 tides into this windshield. And as he did that, the suspect didn't die because he didn't have any penetration of rounds in his chest. So this is very important to understand. Here's the, here's the catch. We always test the pistol in the class, but we also test 300 blackout. 300 blackout, 9-inch barrel, which 
we have available. If you go on my Patreon, you can find the link where you can pick those up. It is a part. It is a it is a firearm part. Um, the nine inch barrel. Um, one in I, I forget the twist. I won't I won't make that up. One seventy five grain, three hundred blackout. Point of aim, point of impact. Either way, outside in, inside out. You see it, you shoot it. That's what you get. Why would the, why would that be a benefit? Because you don't have to think about it. You could aim and and smoke the target that you're that you desire. Five five six, same deal. I had a Wyoming's arm suppressor that was integrated into a five five six uh 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 carbine. I think it was a Wyoming arms carbine, and I had the same in a BCM with an attached Wyoming arms suppressor. Both of the, both of the suppressors, uh, or no, one suppressor was stainless or or uh, yeah, one of the suppressors was steel. The other or stainless. The other suppressor was um, plat, not platinum. I just made that up. Um, not platinum. What's the lightweight? I, if you're listening to this and, and you know what I'm talking about, hit, leave the comment down below. But whatever the lightweight version of that suppressor is, that sparks when it shoots. So I had a lightweight version and a heavyweight version with 556, five, and again had massive deviation. Massive deviation. I mean. Not massive as compared to a pistol, but I had deviation. Like, it went high. Why? Because it's a small projectile moving very fast, and it doesn't take a lot of obstacle to hit to deviate the pattern of round. Why does any of this matter? Because your EDC is not your mobility self-defense uh, firearm. Like, 300 blackout. AR pistol, 300 blackout. Make sure you have that. Have the, the weapons, the, the right weapon, the right cow, the right bullet weight, and, and certainly even the, the right length, a, a six-inch 300 blackout will will tumble that round sideways. You'll still have desired impact and penetration, but you need to be able to affect the bad guy that's between you and that glass and your family in defense of your family, right? Um, yes, shooting multiple rounds in the same spot can work the problem out, but I don't want to depend on 10 rounds to get the right shooting solution or effect on target. I want to use it once and for all. So your EDC isn't necessarily always going to be what your mobility is. On Homestead, let's talk about the uh, home life plan. Um, look, have a life plan. Have a plan to preserve life for everything that's potentially dangerous in your home. Fire escape plan, um, home defense plan. It starts with a conversation, but it also starts with lining out deficiencies. There are a couple ways that that uh, the military plans. You identify the situation, the mission. Uh, you focus on execution. You need service and support or the things that are going to support the mission being successful, and you need command and signal. You need command and signal. You need the, you need the way you're going to communicate, the communication to friendly forces, the communication to 911. The, the list goes on. So when you break that down, the situation is fire escape plan. The mission for everybody to get out of the house unscathed in the event of a fire. You need contingencies to plan because expect that first plan to go wrong. You plan to go out the front door and the front door isn't available, um, then you need a plan to get out the back door as a contingency. The plan starts with a conversation. Um, that conversation starts with having what's called course of action or, or war gaming conversations and asking questions. Honey, what would happen if X? Honey, what would happen if the kids went to get down the stairs and they ran into a wall of fire? Oh, good question. Maybe we need to figure out their escape out of their window with a fire escape ladder. Maybe we need to teach them how to use a fire extinguisher. Well, secondly, um, when it comes to the integration of firearms and kids, I had a good conversation on the range in San Bernardino at Route 66. 66. Let, me, let me put this out there. I have guns that are empty all over the place. Now, my thinking on this has changed extremely over the last couple of years because of my kids, my own kids. Um, how do you introduce firearms to your kids? Nerf guns. Why? Because when they get a Nerf gun, they can make mistakes and not kill themselves. But you could teach them about muzzle awareness, not shooting people unless you're playing the game, uh, eye protection to protect your eyes, muzzle, muzzle awareness, uh, don't shoot at the face, shoot below the neck. Um, two, when, when it's time, um, 
guns, it's not time to play with guns anymore. You need to stop. You could teach safe gun handling skills. You could teach safety. You could teach all the things from a Nerf gun. One of the things that I've changed my mind about is having guns out in front of the kids. I have guns at my kid's age at three and a half out in front of the kids. They are not loaded because I put the loaded or I put the ammunition in a lock box, typically a Pine World box or a safe lock box. Oh, I, I have this. Uh, I'm interested in you guys' feedback on this because uh, recently put it out with a company. There's a company called um, Vault Tech USA called LifePod. Um, I'm not working with them. I'd like to, uh, but I like to test their stuff because I like the portability and the biometrics feature of the box. But similar to what I have, except Pine World's super heavy. These you can put like under the seat, um, wherever you're at. So here's the thing about the psychology of kids and guns. The more you hide the gun, especially if the kid sees you put the gun away, the more inquisitive they become. When you normalize the exposure of whatever it is, it could be the candy, it could be the gun, it could be the knife, whatever, whatever that is, you normalize it, they don't become intrigued by it because there's no incentive. So if I have a gun in plain sight, it's empty. But why, do I have, why would you ever put a gun in plain sight? Well, because I want to normalize guns in my household because if they see the gun, they are not intrigued by the gun because it's not a mystery to them, but they can't load it. They can't chamber around, and the ammunition is locked up. Also in self-defense, especially in home defense, I can get to my lock box that has a loaded gun in it, or I can get to my magazine that has the ammunition in it. The first thing most people would say is, well, Mike, that's not ready access, and I get that, but I do have ready access because I have technical security, I have locked doors, I have all the things outside of using deadly force in my home um, and having a loaded gun topped off sitting next to me, I have all those things to mitigate my overall risk. Even having loaded guns inside of locked boxes, I can get quick access to. At the same time it takes me to like go get my gun and pull it out of a whatever, I don't carry a gun in my waistband in, in, in the middle of my house. I have all these measures of security as well. So think about that as a means um, to further protect your kids. I think that's important. Guys, on the book front, I wanted to tell you about Prepared because a lot of people have been asking me, even though I do this almost every episode, you can pre-order this book uh, right now. It's going to be out in like three months. Um, I, I, I have the opportunity to go on Tucker Carlson in a couple months and I ha or next month, and I have the opportunity to do a lot of media behind this. I want to say thank you for supporting this book. Uh, I wrote this book with the idea of communicating to a broad audience that preparedness isn't scary. But I hope the tools that you get from this book are going to help you set up, and as a point of reference, help you set up and live your best prep life. Um, this is available for pre-order, and, and I appreciate your support on that. With that being said, I'm not, this isn't just the shameless plug of my book, even though that was, um, no doubt. Um, I'm writing a new book. So I already have to pitch a new book because I want to do a book a year. So the next book I'm going to pitch is all about rewilding. Now, I have a rewilding course. It's 72 hours, and it has to do with, imagine if you grew up in the 80s and grew up with Nintendo. When Nintendo was flawed, when it didn't work when you hit the power button, or the screen was all jacked up, you had to defraggle it. The best way to defraggle it is you took out the um, cartridge and you blew into it. And then you reset it, and then it worked. We as a society need to be reset. The Rewilding Reset is likely going to be the title of the book or Rewilding or something like that because I have a formula to reset you um, from technology. Now, my 72-hour course, we get back to ancestral and primal basics, uh, feast and famine, but also um, you're going to feel amazing without the use of technology during that 72 hours. I promise you when you walk away from that experience, you will have the tools to do your own 72-hour reset on your own, but that's the formula. We have a training course that you can sign up at fullcraftsurvival.com, but I'm writing that book, and I'm trying to get Andrew Huberman. Like, I want the neuroscientist, the expert that could back me in the science of it because a lot of it I use from my own experiences, which I think is important, but I want the neuroscientist to back the play because I want you to be educated in the weeds on how the science works. And I have a very top-level um, 
not like high level, I mean like top level, like surface, uh, just scratching it of the understanding of neuroscience, but I study hard and I, I want to bring that education to you. Guys, I want to say uh, thank you so much for listening to this on podcast. Um, oh, wait a minute. We don't do this on podcast. Um, I, I want to know if you want us to do it on podcast. How about that little guy? Um, if you want us to move this to audio only, so you could listen to this on your commute, if you have YouTube premium, you could listen to it, uh, in your vehicle, on your, on your cell phone and like get out of the app and you could still listen to it. That's the, one of the benefits of YouTube premium, but also we are on YouTube subscribe, hit the notification tab. If you want to hear us, let us know in the comments down below, because I might migrate the prep life to wherever podcasts are found the prep life. I will do once a week for forever. Uh, this show is not going away. In fact, when I move down to Salt Lake City, I intend to upgrade the level of our studio, um, the angles, the news feed, all the things that you get, because I love doing this for you guys. It keeps me tuned in, especially in current events, to all the things to educate you and what's going on in the world, and I hope you see profound value in it. If you do, again, leave us comments down below. I appreciate you guys. Uh, I'll be headed off to Texas, Austin, Texas, where I'm going to teach, do some podcast, and then it's off to see Andy. Um, I'm doing a, I'm doing a preparedness seminar with Andy Stumpf and Leah Stumpf at their Black Rifle Coffee in Kalispell on the 18th. We already have 220 people signed up. If you want to get signed up, make sure you go to philcraftsurvival.com. I think we cap it at 250. It might already be at 250. I don't know yet, but look forward to seeing you guys there. Till next time, peace out, guys. Thank you.